Yeah, so I'm going to be presenting this, um, this new method that we developed um, uh, over the past uh, year or so, um, and it's up in BioArchive in case anyone's interested in the details. I'm going to just be giving uh, more of an overview of the pragmatics and uh, of, of the method as opposed to the mathematical basis for it, but um, I'd either be happy to talk about that in the discussion or off to the side, or w you can read the paper and the supplement. Um, so this is um, a, uh, uh, a, a joint effort amongst uh, a number of people, many of whom are in the room, and so I'm just uh, the one presenting, but please make sure that you appropriately acknowledge in, in, in your minds when you think about this method all the people that are listed uh, at the bottom uh, over there. And oh, and I have in red here as a reminder for me to plug that I'm looking for a postdoc to work on these topics. So um, uh, please feel free to either approach me about that uh, or uh, recommend any of your promising uh, graduate students if, uh, that they contact me. Um, so the impetus for uh, this method uh, comes from a phenomenon that I think everyone is quite familiar with at this point, which is that um, at the, in a statistical sense, we find that um, uh, pleiotropy is pervasive. So we find genetic correlations between many different phenotypes in uh, the social sciences and uh, in um, uh, psychiatric genetics. Uh, these are just some uh, 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 what are, have come to be called by some as, the, uh, as genetic atlases or, or uh, heat maps of genetic correlation. This is from a recent paper by the Brainstorm Consortium. And what you can see is, here is that there's a lot of uh, colored cells, meaning that uh, the genetic influences on different phenotypes aren't independent of one another, and that the architecture is in, in, in part shared across different phenotypes. And, and, and a real motivating question here is how can we start to understand this multivariate joint genetic architecture across many different phenotypes? And so if we have a genetic atlas, I think what people often do is they just kind of look at it and maybe they reorder the phenotypes and they look for uh, uh, you know, areas of, of, of kind of uh, uh, high heat, uh, but, but really what I would argue is that uh, what we should be doing is we should be using these uh, 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 atlases of genetic correlation as data to be modeled rather than results in and of themselves. So we can ask questions such as what are the data generating processes that give rise to the genetic correlations? We can compare competing theories about uh, data generating processes. We can ask questions such as, can a high dimensional matrix of genetic correlations among phenotypes be closely approximated by a very low dimensional simple model? Um, we can perhaps incorporate uh, models of joint genetic architecture into uh, multivariate discovery, uh, so kind of a multivariate version of uh, GWAS meta-analysis. And I think most relevant for this conference is we can derive novel phenotypes uh, for uh, use in polygenic score analyses. And I'm going to talk about uh, a number of examples of how we're doing that, but you can see just that uh, I've got two examples at the bottom of conceptually the sorts of things you might be interested in. So rather than, for instance, creating a polygenic score just for depression or just for anxiety or just for neuroticism, we might think about uh, creating a polygenic score for internalizing psychopathology, which is a more general uh, liability towards uh, negative emotion. Or for instance, we might, in, rather than aggregating, we might start partitioning. So we might ask, uh, can we take um, uh, uh, the uh, GWAS summary statistics for educational attainment or for academic achievement, partial out the, the, uh, uh, the variation that is uh, shared with um, cognitive ability so as to create a sort of residual set of summary statistics that represents non-cognitive traits that are still related to academic achievement or educational attainment. And this is work that actually is ongoing by a number of people here, um, and it's led by uh, Hardin, Belsky, uh, Doming, uh, Mitchell, and uh, Michel Nivard. So um, uh, this uh, method that we've developed is called genomic structural equation modeling. It's a very flexible method for allowing the user to uh, specify a number of different models that he or she uh, uh, chooses to specify of the genetic architecture of many different traits simultaneously. It only requires uh, conventional GWAS summary statistics. It, it accommodates varying and unknown known amounts of sample overlap. And it's um, fairly user friendly. It's implemented in a free, uh, open source, self-contained R package. And it's uh, 
ready to download and use today with um, a wiki and examples all online. So just to give a little primer, I'm going to talk about the, um, uh, the, the idea behind what structural equation modeling does. And what it does is it models covariances. So imagine, and in reality we don't typically know this information, but imagine we knew that uh, the generating causal process uh, in, uh, that gave rise to correlations between, uh, in this case, two variables, x and y. So we knew for a fact that x causes y at 0.4. And further, suppose we knew that y causes z at 0.6. Um, this is the path diagram that represents this, but here's just the regression equations representing that exact same idea. Um, if we knew that, that, that this was what was going on, we would also know what to expect in terms of the correlations between these three variables. We'd know that x was correlated with y at 0.4, y with z at 0.6, and we would know that x was correlated with z at 0.4 times 0.6 because of that indirect pathway. So it would be 0.24, which you can see over here. Um, in reality, we don't know what the causal uh, uh, processes, and we also don't actually have the population covariance matrix. We have a sample covariance matrix that we use to approximate the population covariance matrix. So we don't, for instance, have that 0.24 that I just described. We have some approximation of it, 0.27. And we don't know what the generating model is or the, the parameters from that generating model. But what we can do is we can propose a model, and we can evaluate the, uh, the, the model relative to the data. Um, uh, optimize the parameters to most closely approximate the data and then evaluate whether that optimized model fits the data well. In this case, we've got a model that has uh, six unique uh, elements. Well, it's trying to uh, model six unique elements in the covariance matrix, one, two, three, four, five, six. It only has five free parameters. It's two regression parameters, three variance parameters. So this is a model with one degree of freedom. It's more parsimonious than the uh, uh, observed empirical covariance matrix. Um, and of course, we can specify other models that are also parsimonious and evaluate their fit as well and compare the fits of the models to one another. In this case, when you optimize the parameters, you get an approximation to the uh, empirical covariance matrix that is uh, similar but not exact to that matrix and also similar but not exactly the same as the population matrix. Um, we don't need to only include variables that we've measured data for. So in this case, we can specify that there's a latent or unobserved uh, dimension, which we might call a factor, that underlies liability towards these five different outcomes, y1 through y5. And again, we evaluate the fit and estimate the parameters uh, relative to the covariance matrix amongst the observed variables, so y1 through y5. And this is an identified model, so there's nothing wrong with, there's, there's nothing pragmatically stopping us from actually evaluating this model even though we haven't measured f. Okay, so what genomic sun does is it uses these exact principles to model um, genetic covariance matrices that are derived from GWAS summary statistics using a multivariate version of LD score regression. That's all, all, all self-contained within the uh, R package. Um, uh, pragmatically speaking, you don't need to conduct these GWASs yourself. You can download the summary statistics from various uh, uh, freely available sources. I've got two links right there, which are, you know, have thousands of summary statistics that you might be interested in using. Um, and here are some examples of what we've done in our initial paper um, uh, to uh, illustrate this method. So, on the left here, this is a uh, genetic atlas, so to speak. It's a genetic correlation matrix for schizophrenia, bipolar, and educational attainment. These come from uh, real data, uh, real summary statistics. Um, and we evaluated a multiple regression model. We were interested in this question of, well, we see that schizophrenia is associated with educational attainment at 0.15. It, uh, bipolar is associated with educational attainment at 0.27. But schizophrenia and bipolar are themselves correlated with one another. How do, how do we know that the association between schizophrenia and educational attainment is unique of bipolar and vice versa? And so what we do is we just set up a simple multiple regression model in which we ask the question, if we simultaneously predict educational attainment genetics from schizophrenia genetics and bipolar genetics, um, are both paths significant? Are both regression coefficients significant or is just one? Um, the syntax is very simple. If you're used to linear models in R, it looks it's very similar to the LM 
uh, uh, function within NAR. There's really not much to it. Um, there's some output, and here's the regression equation that you get. So you get a 0.16 uh, not significant coefficient for schizophrenia and a 0.4 significant coefficient for bipolar. So it seems that bipolar is predictive of educational attainment above and beyond schizophrenia, but schizophrenia is not predictive of educational attainment above and beyond bipolar. Um, if you were interested in doing so, and since we're really focusing on polygenic scores here, imagine that you had uh, a number of traits that you had deeply phenotyped in a cohort study. Uh, there weren't good GWAS summary statistics for those phenotypes, but you were still interested in the question, are those phenotypes associated with uh, polygenic risk for educational attainment above and beyond the genetics of bipolar. What you could do is you could specify a genomic sem model in which you are controlling for bipolar genetics and estimating the association between a SNP and educational attainment. Do that millions of times over. You don't have to press the button a million times. It'll do it all for you in batch. And, um, and create summary statistics for this new derived phenotype, which is educational attainment residualized for the genetics of bipolar disorder. And this is something that if you had the raw data and you had measured both of these phenotypes in the same sample, you could potentially do something very similar in the raw data. But this does not require you to have the raw data and it does not even require there to be sample overlap. Um, as our second example, we were interested in uh, fitting factor models. In this case, it was for anthropometric traits. What you can see here is a very carefully ordered uh, uh, genetic correlation matrix or genetic atlas for a number of these traits. And because I've ordered this in such an intuitive way, what you can see is you've got a very, uh, a cluster of very highly genetically correlated traits. Why, uh, so the first six variables, then for the remaining variables, they're correlated with each other. But the cross correlations between the first and the second set are much more modest. And so what we can do is rather than uh, attempting to eyeball this pattern and inspect every single cell of the matrix is we can specify a simpler model. This is a model that has 25 degrees of freedom, which means it has 25 fewer parameters than the number of parameters in this observed matrix. And we can evaluate the fit of the model to the data. We can evaluate the parameters and optimize them to the data. And what we see is we see this fairly straightforward uh, result, which is that there's one factor that represents um, the traits that uh, are related to being overweight, and another uh, factor that represents the traits having to do with early uh, growth. Um, this model implies a genetic correlation matrix that looks like this. What you can see is that it's not exactly the same as the original empirically freely estimated genetic covariance matrix. And I would argue that that's okay if the approximation is close but not perfect, because what we're doing is we're perhaps not getting the exact set of parameters, but we're saving a whole lot of complexity in doing, and uh, drawing conclusions that are probably more intuitive for us as science, scientists. And um, I think what exemplifies this idea is this quote by George Box, which is that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Here's another example. What we did is we fit a general factor of liability to uh, psychiatric case control traits. Um, uh, what you can see is that there were these high factor loadings on all of the, on, on, of all of the case control traits on what we're calling this P factor of uh, psychiatric liability. Um, this is the uh, empirical LDSC derived genetic correlation matrix. Then what we did is we, int we, we uh, integrated SNP level information into the model. So in this case, this is just for one SNP that I believe was genome-wide significant. And uh, what you can see here is we're allowing the SNP to have an effect on this general liability factor. And when we do that over and over again for millions of SNPs, we can basically um, uh, derive a, uh, a new multivariate GWAS. And uh, uh, here's the Manhattan plot for that. And what you can see here is that um, uh, the uh, uh, dark uh, triangles represent uh, uh, loci that weren't previously identified in any of the original five sets of summary statistics. So these are new discoveries that we've made simply by virtue of integrating the summary statistics together in a multivariate analysis, but not adding any new individuals. But what you can also see is the purple uh, stars which represent loci that had been significant in the original univariate GWASs, but were no longer significant. And this is exactly what you would expect 
because the point here is that we're not specifying a model that's trying to make discoveries that are specific to individual phenotypes and just boost power for discovery of uh, loci relative to those phenotypes. But what we're instead doing is we're attempting to identify variants that are pleiotropic. So we're identifying variants that are not only related to a single phenotype, but are related to all five. So what we would expect to see is not only would we gain some new hits, but we would actually lose some hits that are significant in the univariate analyses because th those, are, those are variants that are only relevant to a subset or even a single um, uh, uh, trait. Uh, we also have this uh, statistic of heterogeneity, which asks whether or not the SNP effects are significantly at genome-wide levels um, heterogeneous in, in the sense that they are, we can reject statistically uh, that they, uh, that they op the hypothesis that they operate at the level of the general liability factor, and we have to accept a more complex hypothesis that they have individual uh, effects on the individual traits. So we had one, uh, in this particular analysis, one genome-wide significant heterogeneity hit. Um, we took the, the summary statistics from this analysis, and we um, used them to predict uh, uh, continuous uh, symptom uh, counts in UK Biobank. UK Biobank was not used uh, uh, in any of the discovery uh, GWAS summary statistics. And we're predicting both general psychiatric symptomology and disorder-specific psychiatric symptomology. And here is um, uh, a figure that represents uh, the uh, uh, out-of-sample prediction of those uh, symptom counts. And on the left is symptom counts for a, a general uh, dimension of uh, uh, symptomology across all of the different uh, 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 symptom domains. And then the remaining set of clusters on the right are, are disorder-specific uh, symptom domains. And what you can see here, and this actually did surprise us a bit, is not only are we doing a better job with these summary statistics, which uh, the leftmost bar, the dark brownish bar, uh, represents the, uh, the summary statistics derived using the genomic uh, SEM uh, analysis, and then the remaining bars are from the univariate summary statistics. Not only are we doing a better job with the multivariate, the summary statistics that are derived from the multivariate um, GWAS and genomic SEM when predicting general symptomology, but we're actually doing a better job at predicting the individual uh, uh, disorder symptoms within the individual disorder domains. So, for example, this general um, liability towards psychiatric symptomology, symptomology across domains is doing a better job at predicting schizophrenia symptoms than the univariate GWAS summary statistics are at predicting schizophrenia symptoms. So this was actually particularly interesting to us because we were expecting that general would predict general best, but it was actually also predicting specific better. Um, one thing that I'll point out here is that genomic structural equation modeling is not a single model. It's a broad framework. So the model that we use to generate these GWAS summary statistics was specified by us as users based on decisions and goals that we had. And had we chosen to specify different models, the uh, polygenic scores would uh, perform differently. Um, um, but that said, that we can think of that as an advantage because different users will have different goals and they'll be able to uh, specify different models that are consistent with those goals. In this case, we're interested in general symptomology or general liability. You might be very specific, in, very interested in specific liability, in which case um, you would specify a different sort of model. Um, you can do a lot of this modeling even without using polygenic scores or, or incorporating SNP effects into the model at all. If the phenotypes that you're interested in have all been GWAS, you can estimate these relations, be, these genetic relations between uh, different phenotypes all within the context of the structural portion of the model without ever having to export new summary statistics. That said, if you're particularly interested in using the polygenic scores outside of those GWAS phenotypes, perhaps in a deeply phenotyped cohort, then those summary statistics are, are fairly straightforward to um, export and then use to create uh, polygenic scores. Um, I mentioned this earlier. I'll just review very quickly. This is a method that's ready to use today. 
There are examples um, on our wiki. Um, you can ask questions on our Google forum. forum. Um, you can download GWAS summary statistics from many different uh, websites. You don't need to run the GWASs yourself. Um, and these are very flexible models that are fairly, have a very, uh, fairly uh, straightforward um, uh, modeling language uh, that it's easy to pick up. So um, I think pragmatically there's a, a fairly low barrier to entry here. Thanks so much. Okay, um, so I wanna start by thanking the organizers, of course, for giving me the chance to talk to you guys today about uh, general transferability, or as I've sort of renamed this, or lack thereof, of polygenic prediction across diverse populations. So I probably don't need to show you all this plot because it's all very familiar to you, but genetic data has been exploding um, during our lifetimes, of course. So looking at the past just decade alone of genetic studies, on the x-axis we have time, and on the y-axis we have number of individuals included in uh, GWAS studies from the GWAS catalog. Um, and you can see that this has been growing exponentially and has only been picking up more and more over the last few years. Um, but if we fill this in, colored by population, as annotated by the GWAS catalog, and color this by population, you can of course see that there's a very disproportionate number of participants by ancestry. So about 80% of participants in GWAS studies are currently of European descent, which is far out of step with the global population, where European uh, descent individuals constitute about 16% of the globe's population. Additionally, on the bottom here, if you look at the fraction, uh, for those of you who can see it, um, of participants of non-European ancestry as a function of time, we can see that since about 2014, the number of individuals of non-European descent has actually been on the decline or has stalled, indicating that we're in no way on a trajectory to even these imbalances. So this is a major issue, of course. Um, there's a pretty big caveat with this plot, which is, of course, that there's some double counting here. So when we have cohorts like the UK Biobank that come along and sort of just change how everyone is doing um, genetic studies because they're disproportionately studying these cohorts, these get counted every time in the GWAS catalog. So you can, of course, see um, some perhaps uh, disproportionate effect of European cohorts showing up here. So all of my work kind of focuses on this question of how do ancestry study biases in genetics impact the generalizability of knowledge? And I meant to say at the beginning of this that my background is all sort of in population genetics and statistical genetics, thinking about this from sort of a biomedical domain, so I'm a bit of an interloper here in the social sciences world. So we wrote this paper um, last year that talked about uh, human demographic history and its impacts on genetic risk prediction across diverse populations, and there were a few um, takeaways here. Um, some of them from empirical observations and then some of them from simulations coupling coalescent theory and thinking about human history uh, with statistical genetics models. So one of the first takeaways just from empirical observation is that genetic prediction accuracy appears to decay with increasing genetic divergence. So if you're conducting a study in European populations, the more genetically diverged you are from that European population, the, least, the less accurately you can predict a given trait. So this is pretty clear. Um, additionally, we also see that there are arbitrary differences between populations and polygenic scores that are not necessarily driven by some empirical um, true difference in a given trait. So for example, on the top right of this uh, plot here, you can see a polygenic score for height, and you can see that European populations are predicted to be taller than American and South Asian populations, and East Asian and African populations are predicted to be the shortest. And these are not trivial differences. African populations are predicted to be about five standard deviations shorter than European populations. So putting some numbers on these, you would expect that the average African male, given you know, how tall European men are, would be about four and a half feet tall. That's just simply not the case. Um, so coupling some of this um, information with simulations to try to understand what exactly is going on here, we were able to show that neutral human evolution, not even including anything to do with natural selection, negative selection, positive selection, just forgetting all of that, just looking at neutral human evolution, we are able to explain these shifts in polygenic score differences um, using neutral evolution alone. This has been recapitulated recently, um, especially by my colleagues Robert Meyer and Michelle Sohail. Um, in Boston. So they use these giant summary statistics from this, uh, you know, very large scale consortium looking at height and BMI. So here they were looking at height and they recapitulated our results in a much more finer scale cohort um, looking at global populations. So again, what they found was that East Asian and African populations were predicted to be shorter um, than population, other populations around the world. And of course, this doesn't necessarily mirror what we see across the world. 
And then when they looked at this in the UK Biobank, which was a more homogeneously collected cohort and accounted for population stratification in perhaps a more rigorous or uniform way, what they saw is that there are no predicted differences necessarily across global populations in height, which we also know necess to be necessarily untrue. So for example, in the US, if we look at African-American individuals, those individuals with more African ancestry um, tend to be slightly taller on average than those individuals with less African ancestry. Um, additionally, there's been some work done that's been really nice, I think, from uh, Finland. Um, so Sini Kerminen is a graduate student who's been doing some really interesting work coupling population genetics with polygenic risk score work. Um, so there's some work under review that I just want to talk you through a little bit briefly. So Finland is a really interesting case study, I think, because it's a repeatedly bottlenecked population. So you guys are probably aware that there was a bottleneck into Finland, but there were subsequent bottlenecks as people migrated from the southwestern part of Finland into the northeastern part of Finland. And so that population structure couples at some level with a lot of biomedical traits and then a lot of anthropometric traits as well. So one of those is height, our favorite example that we keep going through time and time again because it's you know, collected sort of everywhere. So in this map on the left, I'm showing you the empirical observations of height across Finland. So here there's an east-west um, observed difference of about 1.6 centimeters. So Finns in the southwest are about 1.6 centimeters uh, taller than Finns in the northeast part of Finland. So using summary statistics from Giant, just like um, seen before, uh, there's some stratification built into these summary statistics that's resulted in geographical differences that, out, that are outsized compared to what we observe. So using these summary statistics, they were able to predict a difference of 3.5 centimeters in height between these regions, explaining only 14% of the phenotypic variance. So if you were to explain 100% of the phenotypic variance, of course, this difference would be much larger. You would have to multiply it by several fold. Looking at UK Biobank summary statistics, um, they predict about 0.6 centimeters of difference between Eastern and Western Finland, explaining about a quarter of the variance. So that's about on target with what we would expect if we were able to explain all of the variants. And then using a Finnish cohort, um, they predicted a difference of about 1.4 centimeters um, with about 15% of the variants explained. And these numbers are meaningful for a few reasons. So one is that a lot of the um, you know, understanding now of what's been going on with the giant stratification was perhaps just they didn't account for population stru stratification entirely. Maybe that's why there's some you know, residual structure seen in these differences. Um, but UK Biobank, maybe it's just solved all of our problems, and maybe that's sort of like how we need to design studies going forward. The FinRisk study was conducted in a very similar way to the UK Biobank study. There's four cohorts there, but all of this analysis was done um, in one, you know, sort of mega analysis approach. And so this shows that you're also over predicting the difference between um, these different regions of Finland, indicating that there's still some unknown uh, stratification hiding in the data somewhere and that we don't necessarily have a full grip on how to deal with this residual stratification. Okay, so switching gears a little bit, we are interested in how big of an issue this is if people are interested in translating this, for example, into precision medicine. So we wanted to know if you take a European GWAS, because that's what's most readily available today, and see how well you could predict biomedical traits, um, how well would you do in non-European populations? So we assembled some empirical studies from previous work, including things like schizophrenia, BMI, educational attainment of great interest to this group, and height. And looking across these studies, there were a lot of differences with how people were conducting these studies. So some were looking using methods like pruning and thresholding, some were using LDPRED, and they were looking at different accuracy metrics. So for continuous traits, it's pretty straightforward, but for binary traits, some of them were accounting for differences in case control ratios across traits, and some of them were not necessarily. So there's a lot of differences in how these empirical studies were being done. And yet there's pretty remarkable consistency in the decline, the like empirical decline in prediction accuracy. So relative to European populations, in East Asians, we predict a score for any of these different traits a little less than half as accurately is in Europeans. And in African Americans, we predict uh, their traits a little less than a quarter as accurately. And so a lot of my clinical colleagues are really excited about the um, possibility of translating polygenic scores into the clinic right now. And I argue that based on these numbers, that's just not very feasible. There's no way that if we looked across all prescriptions or all clinical lab tests, that if you did a little less than half as well in East Asians and a little less than a quarter as well in African Americans, no one would see this as a viable test. Okay, so why are these um, 
why are these disparities actually occurring? We could predict, of course, that this was gonna be the case, and this is simply a function of population history or genetic divergence, um, but let's go into a few of the reasons why this is actually um, going on. So the first reason is that GWAS are best powered to discover common variants, and we can see this in this little chart on the bottom. So if we look at the GWAS catalog, we can see that European, um, or that the alleles in the GWAS catalog are most common in European populations, and then they're a little less common in East Asian and African American and African populations. And of course, this means that we should probably be doing studies in non-European populations to a greater extent because there's more low-hanging fruit to be identified in these populations. Another big issue is that there are LD differences across populations. So even if the same uh, causal variant exists in multiple different populations, we might uh, estimate differences across these groups, even if the biology is fundamentally the same, which we have pretty good empirical evidence to say is the case. Um, so on the right, you can see just LD differences in a given region of the genome, but of course, if we look across the entire genome, this um, happens uh, all over the place. So here's a little bit of mathematical intuition for why this is the case. Let's say our Bs or our causal effects um, our epsilons are our residual error, our Rs are our LD matrices, and let's say that our Bs are the same across populations, but our Rs differ. That fundamentally means that our effect size estimates here, or our beta hats, are gonna be different across populations, even if the causal variants are the same. And then the last sort of issue here is that there are, of course, differences in environment, gene-environment interactions here, and then natural selection that have occurred over population history. Um, and then other more complex um, differences that occurred uh, through time. Okay, so my colleague uh, Masa Kanai and I were really interested in comparing polygenic risk score accuracy in the UK Biobank and in Biobank Japan. So these two very large biobanks that had, um, you know, uh, brought together phenotypes from both of these uh, studies. So. What we did is we set up equal size GWAS for 17 different traits in these two biobanks. These were on the scale of about 80,000 to 150,000 um, individuals where they had quantitative phenotypes for all of these measures. And then we computed within and across population uh, prediction accuracy. So our goal was to test, do we see symmetric and comparable polygenic risk score um, accuracies within and across these populations? And of course, it's important to mention that our uh, target data sets in here are, of course, withheld samples. We're not uh, fitting, overfitting here. Okay, so the results that I'm going to show you start with how well we do when we predict in UK Biobank holdout samples. So across these um, 17 different phenotypes, in red, I'm showing you how we do with UK Biobank summary statistics, and in blue, I show you how we do with Biobank Japan summary statistics. And as is perfectly logical, I think, we do the best with ancestry matched um, summary statistics. And then looking in Biobank Japan on the right, um, what you can see is that, again, in blue with Biobank Japan summary statistics, we're doing the best with ancestry matched um, summary statistics. Now, there's some differences that you can, of course, see between the left plot and the right plot. One is that on the right, you see smaller differences between um, the Biobank Japan and UK Biobank samples. And then you can, of course, also see the y-axis is different. So the reason for this, in this particular case, even though we had the exact same sample sizes, there are some cohort differences that we need to be aware of. So UK Biobank is a population-based cohort of relatively healthy people, or actually healthier people on average, and the Biobank Japan cohort is a hospital-based cohort ascertained on 47 different diseases. Additionally, these were collected from a uh, bunch of different hospitals across Japan, and these were, uh, you know, researchers went to these hospitals wrote down what the phenotypes were from electronic health records, sometimes onto paper, and then uploaded these into their own Biobank Japan system. So of course this is a lot more prone to human error um, than the UK Biobank design. So lower heritability um, is a bit of an issue here. So even though we had what seemed like a perfect setup, um, there are some differences in how we performed across uh, populations. Okay, so I think the reason I'm in the new methods section is of course uh, because of a new approach that we're developing to predict um, polygenic scores in uh, more uh, accurately with multiple different populations. So the method that um, Patrick, Raymond, Hue, um, other colleagues and I are developing is the multi-ancestry meta-analysis or MAMA approach. We know this is very aptly named because whenever my uh, partner hears this name, he busts out into Bohemian Rhapsody, which is very entertaining for everybody. <laughs> Um, so our approach assumes that you have uh, two, at least two different 
um, ancestries with summary statistics where GWAS has been conducted before, and you're interested in, in predicting in one of these cohorts or in a new cohort. And so the approach here is that we consider cross-population LD as in addition to within population LD to recalibrate effect sizes for each population. So importantly, you get recalibrated effect sizes for each population um, that allow you to uh, use those to predict um, for any population you're interested in. So this is related to a couple different methods. So the first is LD score regression. I mentioned that we consider both within population and cross population um, LD. So the within population part is just standard LD score regression. The across population part considers LD scores across populations. So instead of an R squared, you consider R from population A times R from population B. Um, additionally, the estimator here is based completely on the MTAG framework or the multi-trait analysis of GWAS that Patrick um, Turley developed and led. So the estimator is the same, but the approach or the, you know, basic components that go into it are a little bit different. So instead of looking across traits, of course, we're looking across populations. So there's some uh, minor differences that I'll mention a little bit. So the status of this is that we're currently implementing this across uh, global biobanks, including uh, the UK biobank, a Finnish biobank, um, a population of admixed American populations. I should mention that this is primarily going to work at first for homogeneous ancestries, and then later we're hoping to extend this to recently admixed populations like African Americans or Hispanic and Latino populations um, because their um, mosaic of ancestry presents additional analytical challenges. Um, and then also uh, East Asian cohorts like Biobank Japan and China Kadori Biobank. Okay, so there's two key elements of MAMA that sort of extend on the um, MTAG framework. So the first is this omega matrix. This particular matrix is a variance covariance of the genetic components, so the um, beta hats in this case. So the intuition for this matrix is that more information is shared when LD patterns are similar and conditional effects are similar. The analog in MTAG was that you would share more information across traits when they're more genetically correlated. Because we're changing this with um, LD patterns, this is of course gonna differ depending on where you're looking in the genome. Um, and then there's also the sigma matrix, a big component of this estimator. This is the variance components uh, variance covariance of error and bias terms. So in uh, MTAG, this is very important for thinking about sample overlap across different traits. Um, here, it's more thinking about maybe differences in uh, certainty of the estimates. So the intuition for this matrix is that we share less information when estimates are noisy or biased. Okay, so to conclude, um, polygenic risk scores coming again from this biomedical perspective um, have a lot of potential, I think, to improve uh, clinical models, but right now they're probably most likely to increase health disparities due to Eurocentric uh, GWAS study biases. So in order to really get at and fix uh, this problem, I think we need much more diverse GWAS studies and new methods to address these major issues. And then lastly, I think comparisons of polygenic predictors across diverse populations are currently scientifically unsound. We don't necessarily have methods of addressing this across diverse populations. Um, this is due to these methods limitations, also to study biases, population by environmental stratification issues, and other, um, other issues. So with that, I wanna thank all of my colleagues, um, especially those guys shown here, my funding, and thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. overall so even if this would lead to health disparities is that a reason not to help the people in clinical settings that could be helped from polygenic scores if that makes sense Um, that's a good question. So, of course, it's an ethical quandary. Do you help those who are already on the most positive end of health disparities, um, or do you help no one? Um, right now, I think our models are not really going to be able to clinically help anyone. Um, so I bring this issue up mostly as a you know, proactive measure to make sure that when this actually does become clinically relevant and implemented translationally, um, that the issue is not as bad as it currently is for everybody. I think we really need to make uh, much more progress into diversifying genetic studies so that this doesn't, you know, perform five, four to five-fold worse in African-American populations, for example. Um, so along those lines, I had a, a similar question um, going to ASU's slides um, earlier. 
a lot of the main uses of polygenic scores in social science research are for controlling out genetic factors um, or for looks at gene environment interactions. And all the results that we've seen have shown that there's a downward attenuation in prediction. And so that will make it simply harder to find G by E effects, right? Which isn't necessarily a negative thing. It's just saying that we're gonna have to have larger sample sizes and do things, you know, we're, we're just not finding anything which results in a null finding, right? So, so is that necessarily a bad thing? So that maybe assumes that your gene by environment effects are the same across populations, and I'm not sure that's the case. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot more work to be done in that area, so I think it's kind of unknown. I mean, you guys would know that better than I do. I'm not a social scientist. Um, so I guess my question was if you could say a little bit more about that, um, the biasing of, of not having portability. Is it always that the predictions will be uh, underestimating the genetic contributions? Um, is that, and I mean, this is sort of a naive question, but is that because uh, uh, of the way the additive models work? Or is it that the predictions are always just more noisy and could fluctuate in, in, in either direction around uh, the true value? or something else. Yeah, so it's you know partially that our estimates are a little bit noisier, but it's also that in our predictors we're using tags, we're not necessarily using causal variants. So our causal variants are gonna be noisily estimated if they're at lower frequencies in some populations. They're gonna be more noisily estimated if LD is lower between populations. And then if there's some you know environmental um, interactions between that particular variant, but not the causal variant um, that we're looking at, that also causes issues. So that's, it's sort of a combination of many different factors, I think, that are um, driving this depleted accuracy if you're looking across diverse groups. So an another question for Alicia. Um, so in principle, LDPRED should recover causal effects of the variants, right? Like assuming you had a very large reference panels, and assuming the mixture model underlying all this is accurate. But when you use LDPRED and then do polygenic score prediction in different ancestries, it still attenuates a lot. So the theory of LDPRED seems to work well, but in practice not perfect. So what is the key difference with MAMA that you expect, or that is actually working, or that you hope will be working um, compared to LDPRED? Sorry, I feel like the, this is like a fireside chat. Apologies. Um, <laughs> the difference between LDPRED and um, MAMA, I mean, there's a bunch, but I think the one that we hope is going to make the biggest difference is that we're actually looking at LD within different populations, within and across different populations, um, whereas LDPRED is only looking at um, LD within one population. So that's the primary factor that we hope is going to help MAMA. It's still very much underway, so we're not sure yet. My question's for Elliot, although I'm only two seats away from you. I don't feel like I need this. Um, in, in, in terms of sample size, like if you wanted to use a univariate GWAS to kind of estimate how many people you would need, what, how would you do that for your genomic SEM? What? Yeah. Um, so in, in terms of rules of thumb, so if you're not interested in estimating polygenic scores or, or, or discovery, if you're just interested in estimating models of uh, genetic covariant structure, you don't need to have the sample sizes that are ordinarily needed in order to be well-powered to, to make discoveries at genome-wide significant levels. Because you're interested not in identifying individual SNPs, but you're interested in <clears throat> estimating genetic correlations and then structuring those correlations. So the sample size requirements would be similar to what are required for LD score regression, which are generally, uh, you know, an order of magnitude higher than what's needed for Gremmel, but uh, several order of magnitudes lower than what's needed for GWAS. So, I mean, maybe I'd probably feel okay with 15 or 20,000, even though I'm not going to make a discovery, I'd probably be able to integrate that phenotype as a node into my uh, structured covariance model. Now, with respect to sample size requirements for discovery and for um, 
uh, polygenic scoring, generally, if, if, you're, if you're lumping as opposed to splitting, so if you're looking at general dimensions of liability, I would, or, and you, you've got phenotypes that are fairly highly genetically correlated, I would expect that you would have at least as much, if not higher, probably higher power uh, uh, in, in the multivariate context of the genomic sem than you would for the individual univariate um, summary statistics. Um, but that's going to depend on heritabilities, what's going in, the genetic correlations. Um, but you know, generally, if you're lumping, um, you're probably, if, if you feel OK uh, calculating a polygenic score based on univariate sum stats, you can go ahead with multivariate uh, uh, some stats based on genomic sem. If you're splitting, so if you're, for instance, parceling out one phen the genetics of one phenotype from the genetics of another, um, you know, probably the rule of thumb is going to be, you know, if they share 50 percent of their variation, then you probably are looking at about a, a, a hit of uh, a, a, a power of about 50 percent. If they share 90 percent of their variation, probably closer to 10 percent. But that's just general guidelines. I mean, we. We can do simulations for, the, 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 because it's a user-specified model, you, you, know, you can only get power for the model that you fit. And so what we would normally do is simulations, and I was just thinking earlier today, based on something that someone said to me um, uh, outside, is um, you, know, you don't want to do a simulation for every possible sample size, because these simulations take a long time. But there are some really interesting methods that will just take a single simulation with a single sample size and extrapolate what the projected sample sizes are for a whole host of other parameter values and, and sample sizes. And I just got on Slack and told my group that that's what we should start working on. So. Sure. Um, Alicia, I have a question for you. I, I love the, the cross-population little experiment you did. And um, I mean, you explained the lower R squareds for um, for both the UKB and the Japanese estimation uh, in the Japanese sample based on measurement error. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I guess two questions. One is there was I don't remember if height was in there, um, but there was even higher measurement error for height in the Japanese data. That seems suspicious um, uh, or weird uh, and. Let's say it all is explained by measurement error. I mean, uh, going into it, if there was no, me if there was equal amount of measurement error, what was your prior? Because I would have assumed my prior would have been that the um, Japanese sample would have had a higher um, R squareds because of lower genetic diversity and therefore uh, picking up more in the LD blocks. Um, and did you have any hypotheses? Um, I I've read your paper, but I don't remember. I don't think I read it so carefully to remember all your um, tests and hypotheses, but going in, should we, should we have a hypothesis that basically um, assuming causal variants are biologically the same, they're, they're present in all populations, should that be the um, sort of our, our prior of which population is going to have more predictability or not, or are there other factors, uh, you know, leaving out measurement error? Yeah, it's an all Japanese sample for Biobank Japan. I love your question. Um, there's actually like so many different like layers to peel off of that. Um, to start with the height thing, um, yeah, so height is not necessarily measured like less accurately across the populations, um, except for perhaps by transcription, human transcription error. Um, what we do see, which I didn't really have time to talk about, is that the, if we look at the transethnic genetic correlation amongst these different traits, um, most of the traits actually have a really high genetic correlation across ancestries, so it's pretty close to one. Um, the two, well, there's three outlier traits there. Um, two of them are maybe usual suspects, height and BMI. Um, there are a lot of theorized reasons about that. Perhaps natural selection differences are acting differently in um, East Asia versus in Europe. Um, so that's one thing that's like sort of a, a conundrum to think about. Um, the other outlying trait was just basophils, which are like just hard to, they're you know, rare cell types, so not going to go into that too much. Um, the 
so the way that we sort of measured this was also looking at heritability in each population and for each trait. And when we do that, we see that the heritability for height is the highest for both ancestries. It's like 0.35 in the Europeans and it's like 0.3 in the East Asians. So that gets at like how much of this is just driven by noise a little bit. Um, for most of our traits, we estimate that the heritability is close to half in Biobank Japan as it is in UK Biobank. So that points to perhaps noisier um, measurements in general. That's also been, a, we know that that's probably the case because when we've looked at heritability in Biobank Japan versus in other East Asian cohorts, it's also a little bit lower, just pointing to there being a little bit of noise. Um, and then you asked one more interesting, oh, your other interesting question um, was, is lower genetic diversity um, pointing to something that we can think about in, in sort of like how heritable a trait is? So that came up when we were doing our simulations in our study last year where we saw that if you have more genetic variants in general based on our um, simulation setup, we expected that your heritability was higher even if you set the you know, global heritability across populations. And if you had fewer genetic variants because there's just like less varying in the population, then you estimate lower heritability. That's probably hard to know, like the extent to which that's the case is a little bit unknowable at this point until sample sizes get quite large across a diverse enough um, set of samples, but I think it's like a really interesting question that's still sort of open in the field, so I don't have a like definitive answer for you now, um, but who knows. And then you said one more thing, <laughs> which was like, um, how much do we expect causal variants to be the same across populations? That's going to be to some extent trait specific, but for those traits where it's been analyzed and looking at BMI, height, um, diff lipids, schizophrenia, uh, there's a few more, oh, I, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, by and large, um, the causal variants seem to be shared in fine mapping studies or in just looking at the um, genome-wide significant findings that are consistent in both populations. It's usually the case that there's allele frequency differences and not heterogeneous effect sizes. So the heterogeneous effect sizes come up every once in a while, but that's much more um, the exception than the rule. Um, I can give you a few examples, but I think the assumption that causal variants are the same and biology in general is the same across populations is a mostly safe one with few exceptions. Yeah, great questions. Um, I have a question for both speakers. So Elliot, I'm just sitting right next to you. Um, so I was trying to run your, your models um, because the, the, the LD correlation between age at first birth and educational attainment, it was 0.7 for the last... Uh, GWAS and now it's 0.73, <laughs> so it's just going up and up. So we were trying to run it, and I guess the, the question I had was um, how we're supposed to interpret the standardized regression coefficients, because they're actually almost identical to the LD um, correlations. So I'd just like uh, to think about that and, and ask a question about that. And then to Alicia, you know, we've looked at, we did this analysis of the GWAS catalog um, and linked it to PubMed IDs, and we looked at Ancestry. We found that, that you know, the non-European ancestry was um, actually mostly used in replications. Um, and, um, and although we have, maybe it's just a bigger question in common, although we're focusing on ancestry, what we also found is 72% of all of the studies was actually the populations came from three countries, the US, the UK, and Iceland. Um, so, um, you know, and so when we're talking about Africa or all of these, I mean, the height variations are enormous across different countries in Africa. And, you know, and we also um, coded the top uh, 1,500 uh, largest GWAS studies, and we looked at the traits of all of the data sets that were used in all of those studies, and we found they were largely older populations and overrepresented by women. So I just wonder what this means, what we're looking at, and if you're going to expand this beyond just looking at ancestry. So, I don't know. Okay, so the, um, so the, un I'll t talk about the un unstandardized and then the standardized. So the unstandardized regression coefficients in genomic stem are scaled in uh, units relative to uh, a phenotypic variance of 100%. So if the heritability is, um, you know, 20%, uh, you're ne never going to get a coefficient, an unstandardized coefficient that, that, that predicts variation that's greater than uh, 0.20. It, the standardized coefficients are relative to the total heritable variation, not the total phenotypic variation. So if you can explain all of the genetic variants in one phenotype by other phenotypes, uh, by the genetic components of other phenotypes, then you're at 1.0. The reason that you would get a, uh, 
a, a standardized regression coefficient that's essentially the exact same estimate as a uh, genetic correlation just from plain vanilla LD square regression is when um, either you only have one predictor in your model because a uh, standardized regression coefficient in the univariate uh, regression con context, single predictor regression context is the same thing as it's equivalent to a, a, a correlation. Or if, you're, uh, predict if you've got multiple predictors but they're genetically uncorrelated, in which case, uh, same thing. Um, yeah, you've asked some really good questions. I think uh, to think about like where do we make progress in general and looking at the you know, studies that are contributing disproportionately to our understanding of global knowledge, we're still out of step even within those countries um, in reflecting global diversity. So looking at the US, um, you know, European descent populations that identify as non-Hispanic white populations are about 60% of the US. That's nowhere near where we're at. Um, in genetic diversity, and you're totally right that the replication um, is, that's disproportionately where the diverse participants are coming from, um, partially to try to help find map um, variants for functional studies, but that doesn't mean that we're doing discovery necessarily as often in those studies, so it's a really, really valid and useful point to keep in mind. Um, in thinking about where we can disproportionately make the most progress, you're also absolutely right that Africa is where humans originate where humans originated, and so it has a disproportionate amount to say about human evolution. It's the continent with the greatest genetic diversity, and in often cases, um, the greatest phenotypic diversity. Of course, in height, there are pygmy populations, there are extraordinarily tall populations on the continent. The continent is so diverse that to pin down um, the population as a single entity is also sort of um, a little silly. So we have some projects going on to see if you had done genetic studies within a different region of Africa, how well that would predict other um, regions. Um, I think. To make inroads, we need to do a few things. So we need to, um, you know, make accessible some of those diverse studies that already exist. So thinking about, for example, um, large diverse cohorts in the U.S. Um, sometimes these are held behind walls that are disproportionately challenging to access for diverse participants relative to, say, the U.K. Biobank, which is open and available. If we're also thinking about something like the UK Biobank, there are diverse participants of non-European ancestry that are not necessarily being analyzed in a lot of large genetic studies, even though in some cases these are the largest cohorts that exist in these ancestries. So there's sort of this left out analytical plan of how we start to tackle this problem. So all very valid points, and I think there are a lot of um, ways to guide how we even these disparities, um, but there's a ton of work to do. A simple question. So this is about the structural equation modeling. And that with the general liability predicting the individual phenotypes better, it seemed to me the right comparison was, was to MTAG. I mean, that you want to, I mean, it would be a little bit magical and very important if somehow the structural equation modeling did a better job at combining the data from a bunch of phenotypes and getting you predictors for the individual ones. But, uh, but the obvious competitor for that is, is MTAG. Uh, I mean, that's not the only thing. I mean, that is, structural equation modeling can be used for a lot of other things, but on that particular thing, it's got to be compared to MTAG. I've tried to avoid <laughs> comparing it to MTAG because um, one is I like Patrick and I want to keep you know, <laughs> le learning from him. And I, he, I, the more I try to compete, the less he tells me. Um, but the, um, <laughs> uh, and, 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 and to your point, also, you know, structural equation modeling has a lot of, of applications, and, and we are much more interested in emphasizing the idea that you can refine the, pho the target phenotype for your GWAS than you can just use this to boost power. So one difference, in my view, is that if you're specifying a factor model, you're interested in predicting only the variants that affect all of the indicators of that factor. Whereas if you specify an MTAG model, which we think we can do as a genomic structural equation model, but why go through all the trouble, just use Patrick's software, um, then you are trying to boost power to discover on the individual phenotypes, not the general liability. And so for instance, you should not lose hits that were previously present or no, unless they were false discoveries from the start. 
Um, whereas with the common factor model, you very much should if the uh, phenotypes are genetically correlated but not perfectly genetically correlated. So I think there's a lot of reasons to use one versus the other that don't result in competition. There is a, 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 an interesting paper that, was, that came out of uh, uh, the TED sample, with Robert Pullman's group, that actually used a bunch of different multivariate methods for deriving um, GWAS summary statistics, which they in turn used to create polygenic scores and then predicted into the holdout sample. And what they found is that generally there was a nice power boost and it was pretty similar across the different multivariate methods. So um, I, do, I don't want to in any way claim that I can outdo an, a multivariate method with respect to prediction accuracy because I think I would, I would be wrong or putting, putting myself out there too much if, if that's what I claimed. 